here. So everybody check your audio and your video. Also tonight, please use the chat box in Zoom if you're familiar with that. Um, it's on the bottom um, Zoom toolbar and you can communicate with me in that way and then I will address your questions at the end of the presentation. I'm Ann Carmichael and I am a student financial aid consultant and I've been in the business for over 20 years. I still don't know everything, but if you have a question that I can't answer, I will get an answer for you. Now, I'm sure that your counselor has already told you that the Louisiana Department of Education has asked that the class of 2021 submit the free application for federal student aid as a requirement for graduation. And this simply ensures that your money is ready and waiting for you at the college uh, that you decide upon and you are ready to go. You don't want to have any delays or any of your classes being dropped as you try to go through the financial aid process um, later in the academic year. Now college can be expensive, so I wanna to talk to you a little bit about some of those costs tonight. Those costs include equipment, books, and supplies, like your textbooks and notebooks, a computer perhaps if you need one, your personal expenses like your phone bill, money to do your laundry if you're living on campus, a fuel for your car, and any food purchases outside of your meal plan. Room and board is a big expense, and this can include your dorm room, or an apartment if you're planning to live off campus, and then that would also include perhaps your electricity, water and gas, your groceries and cleaning supplies. And then the biggest chunk, which is tuition and fees. And that would include parking, library, technology and athletic fees, and also your campus transportation. But it's good to note that there is financial aid available and those that provide that financial aid are the US federal government, our state government, the college and career school that you're planning to attend and then nonprofit and private organizations. Every year, the federal government provides more than $120 billion in student financial aid. And believe it or not, a lot of that does go unawarded. And we just wanna make sure that you have your portion. The types of federal student aid include the federal Pell Grant, the federal Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant, the Teacher Educational Assistance for College and Higher Education Grant, the Iraq and Afghanistan Service Grant, Federal Work Study, and direct subsidized, unsubsidized, and PLUS loans. Federal grants are a form of financial aid that doesn't have to be repaid, so you want to make sure you're applying for and accepting any grant monies that are offered. The federal grant family includes the Pell Grants, which are for undergraduates with financial need. FSEOGs are also for undergraduates, but for those with exceptional financial need. And you might find that you were offered Pell and FSEOG. Then the service grants for students of military parents who've died defending the um, country following 9-11 and teach grants for students pursuing a teaching career. The Federal Work Study Program provides part-time jobs to help students pay for their education expenses. So when you tell the financial aid office that you're interested in Federal Work Study, you're gonna be considered for this program. And this is a FAFSA question. You'll be asked if you're interested. You can answer yes, no, or I'm not sure. So we always encourage students to select yes, you're interested in federal work study because it doesn't obligate you to work while you're in college, but it does let the financial aid office know that you're interested in being considered and they might offer you opportunities. 
that they know of on campus. Now this looks really good on your resume. Once you graduate from college, you've already got something to add to your professional resume. So I'll encourage you to consider this. Direct subsidized loans are based on financial need and no interest is charged on this type of loan until you graduate or cease to attend. Now almost everybody is eligible for direct unsubsidized loan regardless of financial need. But it's important to note that the interest begins to accrue on these loans once they're fully dispersed, which is usually in the spring semester and then throughout the life of the loan. So there's a big difference you can see between the direct subsidized and unsubsidized loan. When you receive your aid offer, try to remind yourself um, using this tip, the U in unsubsidized means that you always pay the interest. And if you're borrowing over a four year college career, that means that those loans are accruing interest all four years and then the remainder of the payment period. So be careful about accepting the unsubsidized, unsubsidized loans. If loans are offered to you, um, and you're going to a pricier college, you might also be offered private student loans, but you always want to accept the federal student loan portion first because payments aren't due until you graduate or cease to attend. The interest rate is fixed and at a lower rate and no credit check is required. These loans are in the student's name and you're building credit while you're in school. The private loans should only be accepted on an as needed basis because most are gonna require payment be made while you're still in school. The interest rate might be variable and it's often much higher and they almost always require a cosigner. So students and families need to do their research before selecting a private loan lender because the interest rates and incentives to borrow will vary. To dispel the myth, almost everybody is eligible for some type of federal student aid. And all federal student aid and most institutional and private aid is contingent upon completion of the free application for federal student aid or the FAFSA, which launched on October 1st. Um, and it launches every October 1st. So remember, you're applying for one academic year and you must resubmit and renew your FAFSA every year you're in college. Student financial aid is awarded on a first come first served basis. So submit your FAFSA as soon as possible and get to the head of the line so that when aid is being offered, you'll be one of the first. Remember to pay close attention to the deadlines that are set forth by the college that you're attending. There's state deadlines for your top scholarship and there are federal deadlines. Your counselor may also have a deadline to meet your graduation requirements. So check with her as well. Now, you wanna begin the FAFSA process by collecting all of the documents needed to complete the form. And these are going to include the student, and parents' social security cards because the FAFSA must reflect the names and numbers exactly as printed on your most recent card, even if your name has changed. Perhaps you remarried mom or dad, well, maybe not dad, but mom, perhaps you remarried and you did not change the name on your social security card. For FAFSA purposes, you must use the name on your last card. So make sure you have those with you. You'll need your 2019 federal income tax returns because the IRS data retrieval tool, if you choose to use it, will ask you to enter your name and address exactly as printed on that return. Even if it's been misspelled and we've seen that happen, if street isn't spelled out or avenue was used in error or say you've moved since 2019, you do have to enter what's printed on the return. You'll need your W-2s 
because there's information on this form that might not be listed on your tax return and your bank statements and records of investments because you're going to be asked to report those balances as of the date you submit your FAFSA. Now you wanna begin the process by creating your federal student aid ID because it allows students and parents to identify themselves electronically when accessing federal student aid websites, such as the FAFSA. It's gonna consist of a unique username and password that you create, and it should reflect only your personal information. Each student and one of his parents should create an ID by visiting fsaid.ed.gov. And remember, students use your personal email address. Don't use your school email because once you graduate, that email address is going to be disabled and federal student aid will have no way to get in touch with you. Um, and also, do not share information. Students don't use mom or dad's mobile phone in your um, ID, perhaps as the alternate phone number and vice versa with parents because this is considered shared information and it's going to cause you trouble when you try to sign your FAFSA with your electronic signature. Your FSA ID username and password is your official electronic signature and it's legally binding. So make sure you're recording it and keeping it in a safe place. You're gonna need it every year that you submit a FAFSA. If you don't have access to a desktop computer, you can download the FAFSA mobile app. It's called My Student Aid, and you can use it to submit your FAFSA on your mobile phone or any other device with internet access. Or you can complete the FAFSA using the web-based version at fafsa.gov. Now begin the FAFSA process by logging in with the student's FSA ID because the FAFSA is the student's application for federal student aid. The parent FSA ID is gonna be used if you choose to transfer your tax information from the IRS into the FAFSA and the parent shall use your ID again to sign your student's FAFSA. The high school class of 2021 should complete the 2021-2022 FAFSA because that's the academic year that you're applying for financial aid. There are eight sections that need to be completed before submitting your FAFSA. Those include the student demographics, where, where you're gonna be asked to provide your social security number, name, date of birth, your email address and physical address, your residency status and your gender. Now notice up on the top left-hand side of each page, they'll tell you whose information they're asking for in that blue ribbon that runs across uh, the top of the section. It's this one says student information. That's important to note because okay. you're gonna flip flop between student and parents info. Awesome. The next section is called the school selection section. And this is where you're gonna report the name of your high school the colleges that you would like your FAFSA data to be sent to, and the housing plans for each of those colleges. Then the dependency <laughs> status where you will be asked to consider 10 questions to determine your dependency status. And we're gonna talk more about that in just a few minutes. You'll be asked the number of dependents living in your household. And remember, this is gonna be the student's um, information. You'll be asked for your parent's education level. And a lot of parents are not sure why they're being asked this, these questions about their education. However, it's important to note that there could be additional financial aid for students who are first generation college students. So be sure you're answering those questions accurately. Then you'll move into the parent demographics where parents will be asked their social security numbers, their names, um, their marital status, and their dates of marriage, divorce, or separation if applicable, and their personal email address. Then the parent financials. 
you're going to um, ask be asked um, to report your working wages from 2019. And this is where you will be asked if you'd like to transfer your information from the IRS into the FAFSA. And we'll talk more about that as well. You'll be asked if you received any federal benefits and how much you received. And then at, you'll at, be asked questions about your savings and investments. Now, don't be confused when you go to the next section and it looks exactly the same because the student financial section is exactly the same as the parent. However, they want to know more about the student's income and they'll ask um, how much they earned, et cetera. Then it's time to sign and submit your FAFSA. This is where students and one parent will sign electronically. Once you do sign your FAFSA and submit it, you will have the opportunity to review the confirmation page. And as you move through the FAFSA, if you have a question about a specific question, you will look over to the right hand side and see the question mark. It is in gray and it's in a dark blue box and you'll see one beside every question on the FAFSA. If you click on the question mark, it will describe in more detail what they're expecting you to answer. If you do have other questions, there are hyperlinks provided. Um, you can request an online chat within the FAFSA. You can chat with someone at Federal Student Aid. You can call them directly, or you can call Leela's FAFSA helpline and we'll be happy to help you. But for this session, I'm going to cover only the most commonly asked FAFSA questions. Now, if you have one that isn't addressed, please feel free to drop it in the Zoom chat box below, or if you wanna wait and contact me after the presentation, I'm going to give you my email address and our uh, FAFSA helpline again. So be sure you jot that down. The citizenship requirement. Now students must be citizens or eligible non-citizens to complete a FAFSA. But if the parents are neither a citizen or an eligible non-citizen, those parents will enter zeros any place within the FAFSA that their social is asked for. Young men between the ages of 18 and 26 must register with Selective Service to be eligible for any federal benefits. And because grants, work study, and student loans are administered by federal student aid and considered federal benefits, you should be registered. Now, if you haven't already registered, you can do so within the FAFSA. Um, one young man, reported last night he's not 17 and he's not 18 yet so he shouldn't you know should he still uh, register within the FAFSA for selective service and the good news is if you choose to register yes you can register at any time and on the date that you turn 18 you will automatically be registered with selective service now if you choose not to be not to register with selective service and that's your choice just understand that your FAFSA will not be marked complete and you will not be offered any uh, federal student aid whatsoever. So if you're planning to pay out of pocket for your education, that is your choice. But if you wanna make it a little easier on yourself, you will go ahead and register and please feel free to do so within the FAFSA itself. Now only the colleges that you list on your FAFSA in the school selection section are going to consider you for student financial aid. Um, they're not gonna automatically send all your personal and financial information out to every college across the country. You have to give them permission. So make sure that you're adding every school that you're considering. Even if you haven't been accepted for admission at those colleges, go ahead and list them here in case you do have a change of heart or you may perhaps you're accepted to a few colleges um, later on in the academic year. Now you can add up to 10 colleges 
each time you submit your FAFSA. So if you're planning to apply to more than 10, you'll want to follow the instructions listed um, here by selecting the hyperlink under follow these instructions. And they will give you a little more detail on how to do that. Now, I want to talk about the dependency status questions. I'm just going to go over them quickly one at a time. Um, and then we'll talk about why we're being asked these questions and what to do after the fact. The first one is, will you be 24 or older by January 1st of the school year for which you're applying for financial aid? Are you married or separated but not divorced? And remember, they're asking this, these questions of the student. Will you be working on a graduate degree? Do you have children who receive more than half of their support from you? Do you have dependents other than children or a spouse who live with you and receive more than half of their support from you? Are you currently serving on active duty in the U.S. Armed Forces for purposes other than training? So if you're going straight into boot camp or basic training, you're still just considered a dependent student for FAFSA purposes. Are you a veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces? At any time since you turned 13, were both of your parents deceased? Were you in foster care? Or were you a ward or dependent of the court? Are you an emancipated minor? Or are you in legal guardianship as determined by a court? Are you an unaccompanied youth who's homeless? Or are you self-supporting and at risk of being homeless? And if you can answer yes to just one of these questions and provide a legal document supporting your claim, then you're considered an independent student for FAFSA purposes, and you're not required to provide parental information. Everyone else does need to provide parental information if they want to be considered for federal grant monies, which are the free monies. Now, unfortunately, for FAFSA purposes, you're not considered an independent student simply because you file your own taxes or you live alone and support yourself. So say you can't answer yes to one of the previous questions, but you are sort of in a situation that you feel like um, you might need some additional assistance, you can contact your financial aid office and speak with a counselor and ask them to just consider your situation. They might, um, they might help you out. Now, one of the most commonly asked questions is who you should report as your parent on your FAFSA. The parent or parents that you've lived with the longest in the past 12 months should be listed on your FAFSA. So if you live with both of your biological parents, that's easy. You're just gonna list both of them. If you lived, if the parent that you lived with the longest in the past 12 months is separated, divorced, or was never married, then that's the parent you should list on your FAFSA. However, if that parent is remarried, you now must include his or her spouse. So a step parent would then be reported as parent two on your FAFSA. In other words, federal student aid wants to know the financial standing of the household that the student has lived in the longest in the 12 months prior to the date that the FAFSA was submitted. If you're identified as a dependent student, but your parents will not provide information on your FAFSA, you can simply answer, I'm unable to provide information about my parents, state that you do not have a special circumstance and submit your FAFSA without parental information. But it's so important to contact your college's financial aid office to discuss this situation. Um, because if you don't, you're only going to be offered federal student loans. It's important to remember that your college financial aid office 
is going to be the one who's determining your aid and offering you that aid. It's not federal student aid. The FAFSA is simply a generic form, a vehicle to get your personal info over to the college financial aid office. So talk to them about any special situations that you might have. Now to expedite the processing of your federal student aid, the student and parents should attempt to use the IRS data retrieval tool. If you're having trouble using this tool um, and transferring your information from the IRS website into your FAFSA, please contact federal student aid or call our FAFSA helpline and we're happy to assist you with this. Sometimes it can be just um, something simple that can be adjusted within your FAFSA or your FSA ID and then you can give it another try and um, most often you're able to link. The reason that it's so important to try to use this tool is that it can greatly diminish your chances of being selected for verification. Um, if you find that you can't link to the IRS, you can always um, manually enter your information or say you, you didn't work um, in 2019, you didn't have any working wages. In that case, you would manually enter your information. But if you can use the tool, you'll be taken over to the irs.gov site where you'll see this page. And this is where your 2019 um, tax return will come in handy. You need to reflect exactly what's on that return in these fields. And then once you submit, your info will be transferred over into the FAFSA. Now it's almost time to sign and submit your FAFSA, but I'm going to encourage you to review this student aid report and it's going to pop up right before the signature page. Look over it because you'll see that it's a reflection of every question you were asked and your answer to each of the questions. And it's so important to make sure that the financial aid office has correct information about your situation so that they can um, accurately and timely process your federal student aid. The student and one parent should sign the FAFSA using the FSA ID. And if you happen to press submit my FAFSA without signing, your FAFSA is gonna be considered incomplete. I have it on mute, will it go? And you're this going to, um, <laughs> you are going to, oops, I think somebody, I think somebody needs to mute their, mute their um, Zoom. Okay, so if you Love do you. forget to sign your FAFSA and you've submitted it, um, you will hear from Federal Student Aid. They will send you weekly reminders that you need to walk back in, correct, and resubmit your FAFSA. Once you do press submit, you're going to want to review your FAFSA confirmation page. And although the student is going to receive a confirmation via email that he submitted his FAFSA, this is the only time you're going to see this much detail. So you may want to go ahead and print this page and keep it for future use. But you'll notice as you look through, you will see the next steps that the student needs to take to complete the process. You'll see a list of colleges that you reported that you want your FAFSA data to be sent to. You can review your estimated expected family contribution and consider your financial aid estimates. And I'm gonna emphasize estimates because that's what these are on this confirmation page. These estimates are derived by the information that you manually entered on your FAFSA. So the financial aid office has to verify everything that's, um, that's listed here, except for your tax information if you use the data retrieval tool. Once your FAFSA is fully processed, it's then shared with your colleges and they will begin to identify any aid that you might be eligible to receive on their campus. Now, if your family's financial situation has changed since 2019, and I know a lot of people are going to find themselves in these uh, situations this year, 
you want to contact your financial aid counselor because they have the ability to adjust your aid if say your parents lost their jobs or if they had a reduction in hours, uh, there were some medical expenses that weren't expected. A college financial aid counselor can use his or her own professional judgment to adjust your aid offer, but you do need to uh, contact them. That'll be your responsibility. Then your net price is gonna be determined by each count college counselor by subtracting any grants and scholarships that you might be eligible for from your cost of attendance. And that's the net price. The net price can then be paid in cash, out of pocket, or um, by accepting student loans to pay that balance. Your student financial aid offer should reflect the college's cost of attendance and any grants, scholarships, work study, and student loans that they can offer you. So be sure you're reading this carefully and that you're responding to any requests they may have of you so that they can process your financial aid. Now remember that you're going to receive a separate financial aid offer from each college that you've listed on your FAFSA. This is why it's important to apply to and send your FAFSA data to as many colleges as possible. We've seen some students apply to Tulane University and get a full ride and apply to LSU and get a minimal amount of money. So you never know what you're gonna be offered by a college. Just make sure that you are um, keeping all of your options open. You'll want to accept your financial aid in this order, grants and scholarships first, because this is gift aid that doesn't have to be repaid. Next, federal work study, because you've earned this money and you don't have to pay it back. And then loans are your last resort because these are borrowed money and you do have to repay them with interest. The student financial aid process is explained in detail and Leela's um, FAFSA completion guide and workbook, and it's free for all Louisiana high school seniors. So if your counselor hasn't um, distributed these to you, it's an electronic version this year. Uh, um, you can contact me, email me, or give me a call, and I'll be happy to send that over to you. I'm going to include a copy of our uh, checklist for college planning for seniors as well. Now, scholarships. I know your counselors have all talked to you about scholarships and how important they are to apply to. You know that these are gift aid and they don't have to be repaid. And there are thousands of them and they could be offered by um, the colleges, by your parents' employers, some private or nonprofit community organizations, maybe social organizations that your parents um, belong to. Um, some scholarships are merit-based and some are based on financial need. But either way, it's worth applying for them because applying for and receiving scholarships is going to reduce the cost of your college education. So talk with Mrs. White and also contact the college financial aid offices or your admissions officers at uh, the colleges you're interested in. They probably have some good ideas on scholarship opportunities. This year, Leela is offering two scholarship opportunities. The one most important to seniors this year is our FAFSA completion scholarship. It's a $1,000 reward and only Louisiana high school students are eligible to apply. Now, if you have older siblings who are already in college, we also have a $1,000 scholarship. It's called our Choose Louisiana Scholarship, and it's for students attending a Louisiana college. You can find out the details about these and also the applications for these scholarships at leela.org. Now for students or parents who are going to pricier colleges or um, and need help paying for college after you've accepted all of the federal money and the uh, free dollars, your scholarship dollars as well, 
Leela does have a nonprofit education loan program, but this is just as a last resort. You can find out more about that at leelachoice.org. Your questions are always welcomed. So now is the time if you have questions to drop them in the Zoom chat box. And I know this is a lot of information to absorb, uh, but just know that you can always contact us and we'll be more than willing to help you. Here is our FAFSA helpline again and my email address. And I'm going to give um, you all a minute or so to see if anybody has any questions that you would like me to address in the session. I want to uh, let you know that a copy of this presentation and other financial aid tips are going to be posted on our YouTube channel. So if you want to take another look at the presentation or fast forward it to a section that you have questions about, um, follow us at Ask Leela on YouTube and I'll also provide this to your counselor. I'll check the chat box. All right, I don't see any questions pending. I want to thank you again for having me, and I hope you'll always feel free to give us a ring if you need us. Good night.